Over on my Discord, I have a section that is dedicated to suggestions for content to put out here on YouTube, and I often go there to get inspiration for different topics that I'll cover. Sometimes some of the things that get posted there are either a little bit niche in what they're asking for, or they're just a little bit too small to really make a dedicated video about, so I thought it would be fun to do some quick hit topics that are just sort of all over the place, but just about CSS and and some of the cool things we can do with it. And maybe they'll even answer some questions that you've come up along the way as well. So we're gonna dive right into this first one, which is asking about image set and looking at what that is. And one of the reasons I haven't covered image set yet is just the browser support isn't quite there yet. So we're gonna be using Firefox to jump into it. And this is a topic I've wanted to cover, but uh, I'm waiting for Chrome's browser support to get better, which they're not really hinting at yet. Uh, but the idea with using image set is Right now, um, with our images, we're either setting a JPEG or you could use a WebP or you could use an AVIF or whatever. But the we have like a picture element in HTML where you can, right with the picture, you can set different sources and that's what image set actually allows us to do. So what we can do is just a background image like normal, but then here what you do is you'd have your image set. And this is supported actually, um, let's just take this out for a second. Um, so you get your image set. And if this, if you wanted to play with this in Chrome, you can already. So it's WebKit image set like that. And then, so you just need a prefixed and non-prefixed version. But even this version of it with Chrome, it supports different resolutions of an image. So if you have like a low res, medium res, high res that you want to bring in, you could do that in Chrome right now, as long as you're using WebKit. But if you want to use different image formats, that's not yet supported in Chrome. And that's what we're going to look at now where I have that image. And so with that in here, we're missing one more thing where we actually have to tell it what it is. So this is exactly if you're familiar with the picture element um, where I have to do type and then inside the type, just like if we were doing a picture element, you'd have your image and then here you'd put the type. So in this case, it is a JPEG and it's not working now just because I have too many closing parentheses. So that should fix that. Uh, and there we go, my, my background image has come in and it's working fine. And but you can see that's just working with my JPEG right now. But because we have an image set, we could bring in multiple different ones here. So just really fast, we have that. And actually, let's just copy and paste this. And now you can see my background image is still coming in here, but I've set it up for an AVIF, a WebP, or a JPEG. But as I mentioned, this will work in, uh, I believe, Safari, definitely Firefox, because we're in si Firefox now. And if you do want to have this as like a progressive enhancement, let's say, one option would be to do the background image here that's only looking at your JPEG and then having it the second time uh, right here, which is using the image set. So if the browser doesn't recognize this one, it's going to use that. But if it does recognize this, it's going to use this instead. And then it can get a higher performing, you know, get a, a better compressed image um, as, as a quick example there of how, and I guess in that case, you could drop the JPEG maybe from here, whatever you want. But basically just like image works. And if you don't know about the image, I've, I'll put a link to it, a video down below on that because it's a, a nice useful one, but we're sort of getting there with background sizes. Um, and as I said, we can do it with resolutions too. So you could have like your one X, your two X and your three X, so you can give DPI and other information there. And I'll put a link to the MDM article that covers uh, image set down below if you're curious to learn a little bit more about it. All right, this next question was, again, looking at something a bit specific, but about position absolute that I think is worth looking at. And I've covered position relative and absolute in a lot more detail in other videos. So if you'd like something a bit more comprehensive, once again, down below. Uh, but basically they're asking about this black box overflowing its parent. And so like this specific thing here where we have this example with position absolute. So let's, let's start by turning off this position absolute right here. And you can see, um, and even we have this orange, let's make this like 20 pixels just to make it more obvious what we're working with. And so right now we have the black box that's inside of this orange box and there's a display flex probably on here, which is causing the stretch to go there. But when we do a position absolute on this example, which is the black box, everything shrinks down and it overflows out the parent. And this just has to deal with how position absolute works where things are pulled out of the flow. So normally when we have, when we don't have position absolute on something, it just lives within that space. But as soon as we do a position absolute, it gets pulled out of the flow. So it's still positioned in the same place because we're not using something like top, left, right, anything like that. So whenever we do a position absolute, that item stays exactly where it would be on the page by default, but it's pulled out of the flow, meaning nothing else around it actually sees it anymore. And you know, the parent just shrinks down as if it's not actually there. This is true, even though I believe we, or it's here and we have a class or this, this div has a position of relative right here. So the position relative, when we use that, it's less, it's not about like I can see 
It's not about the parent seeing the child. It's about the child seeing the parent. Or not the parent, but seeing the, the nearest ancestor that actually has a position on it, um, we should say. So in this case, it's a few levels outside because we have this div, then this div, and then it's finally here. Uh, so let's just say, uh, and if I remove this position relative right now, nothing would actually change because we're not using top, bottom, left, or right. Uh, or actually, no, that's not true. It did change. I didn't think of that. Uh, in this case, it did change because we have this width 100%. So the width 100% is looking at the items containing block. And so it looks at wherever the nearest containing block is, which would be the nearest thing that has a size on it or a position on it, I should say, not a size. And in this case, it's the viewport. So it's actually 100% width of the viewport, which is kind of awkward. So let's put that position relative back on here. Uh, so again, when we have that positioning, it's about what element is this referencing when we're doing things like width, things like height, if they're percentages, or if we're coming in and saying something like left of, I don't know, negative 50 pixels, just to throw a number on there, it's going to move negative 50 pixels left based on the position of this div. If I were to take this off, now it doesn't have anything else, so it's going to be the viewport and it would cause some overflow going that way. You can see it's pushed over a little bit right here. So this is where understanding this idea of containing blocks can be really important. And if this is, if you do struggle with positioning, I have a video that deep dives containing blocks and some of the weird things that can actually create new containing blocks, uh, whether you're dealing with position fixed or absolute. So I'll link to that one down below as well. All right, this next question was a bit more of a suggestion to look at CSS Houdini's at property rule. And if you don't know about CSS Houdini, it's an API that exposes parts of the CSS engine and gives us some extra powers. This is a video I've been waiting to talk about in a lot of detail, but once again, browser support is not fantastic. It's still an experimental feature. So I won't do it in depth until browser support's better, but just really fast on why it's exciting. We'll look at it right now. Basically, one of the simple ways, or one of the ones I always come to, is if we wanted to do a background or a gradient like this that moved, the way we sort of have to do it is by making a bigger gradient um, that has a, a big size and you're actually changing the background position when you hover or when you do other stuff like that and it's a little bit of a hack it works fine but you're you're not actually changing the colors of the gradient because we can't do uh, this is actually a background image right when we have a gradient uh, and background image is not an animatable property so you can switch between two but you can never transition even if you're using colors in here uh, and that's where app property comes in where it allows us to use custom properties but to be able to do a little bit more with them. So here I've set up two different colors uh, using the app property rule. And if you're familiar with custom properties, the naming of things is still the same. You do your double hyphen and your name, but we're not doing this in the root or anywhere else. Uh, we're just doing this as an app property rule, and then we can define it. Uh, we have to give it a syntax, and this is where the big departure from regular custom properties comes where with regular custom properties, the value could literally be anything. It can be a string, it can be a number, it can be a color, it can be, it, you can just put whatever you want. And as far as CSS is considered, it's valid, but it doesn't know what that is. And that often limits how they can actually be used in the sense of animation or other things that could potentially come up. So we have to say the syntax, it could be a number, it could be a percentage, uh, it can be a string. There's a lot of different options that you can put for the syntax. The inherits can either be true or false. So normally um, custom properties do inherit, but you can set it to false if you don't want it to inherit or put it to true, it's up to you. And then the initial value, and then you just put whatever you actually want the value to be. And one thing that's very important with this is you do need all three of these for the custom property to work this way. So make sure you have all three of them. I've gotten uh, caught in the past. Uh, and then we just need to come down here and set them up just like you would with your custom properties in a, a background gradient. And of course, then we can change how this is working. You will notice it's not working here though. Nothing has showing up and that's because we're in Firefox now. So let's jump on over to Chrome and we started in Firefox because what I was doing there wasn't supported in Chrome properly. So here we have my gradient set up. Uh, we can actually see it. Nothing has changed. It's the exact same CSS, but the, the gradient is actually showing up. So what we can do now, and this is the, the fun part, um, is we can do a transition on our custom properties that are there. So now what we can do is I can come down here and redefine, say my color one is going to be red now. Uh, and let's do my color two. And let's, you know, we don't have to use keywords. We can do anything we want here. Uh, so let's do a hex code of zero F zero. And let's see if this works. Actually, at first it won't transition. We're just gonna get this happening. 
uh, if we do want it to, and that green is really overpowering that, eh? There should be some red on that side, but anyway. Um, oh, my background size is at 200. That should fix everything. There we go. Ah, much better. Now we want that to transition. So what's interesting here is you can do your transition of just the custom property. So color, color one is going to be say 500 milliseconds and we can even do color two of, I don't know, 1500 milliseconds, just cause why not? Uh, and then we get the transition of the two colors there on the gradient. We don't have to do any weird hacks or moving and you could do this with numbers or percentages even as color stops. You could do this for all sorts of different stuff with gradients. And of course there's other use cases that this would be useful for as well. Uh, but this is just one of the ways that I, I, I think it's me great because I'm just sick of having to animate background position. But for now, we can't really use it, but definitely worth being excited for for when we do have it. And the very last question is this one saying, suggesting a, a, a content on Tailwind. And I kept this as a quick hit just at the end because I do get asked a lot about Tailwind. And so I thought that I'd at least mention it in a video uh, to get more people informed on my position of it. Of My, my TLDR is uh, that... I, I, I see why people like it, but it's really not for me. I like authoring CSS and writing it like this. Um, I also find that debugging it becomes a bit of a nightmare. You need to know CSS to be able to use Tailwind anyway, but people use it as a bit of a crutch and they get stuck uh, and just because they're not super familiar with CSS. So some of the problems I see coming up that I run into are people asking in the Discord server that are looking for help. Um, that are using it again debugging it becomes a little bit harder than it has to be because you're basically looking at inline styles uh, but I could see why how, how you could throw together a really fast site and just work really quickly and not have to worry about CSS which is you know if you're focused on other stuff and you need that to come together quickly I get why people like it um, but definitely for me I like authoring my own having fun with it um, and experimenting with new features and playing around with stuff and and just, yeah, that's that's sort of my my stance on, on Tailwind. So if it is your jam, and keep on jamming with it. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but on my channel here, there, there won't be any Tailwind content. Uh, so yeah, don't, don't hold your breath for that. And with that, if you do have any content suggestions and you'd like to let me know about them, if you just want to hang out with other developers, front end, back end, all ranges of experience, or you have questions that you'd like to ask and all of that, there is the Discord server that you can join. It's a lot of fun, a lot of amazing people there. So I spend as much time in there as I can, which hasn't been a lot lately, but I do poke my head around there. So if you're looking for that type of community, definitely come and check it out. And with that, I'd really like to thank my enablers of awesome over on Patreon. Jan, Johnny, Michael, Mr. Dave, Patrick, Simon, and Tim, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner on the internet just a little bit more awesome.